John, we ready to go? Yeah, we're ready. Would you be quiet? Well, when did you go to start this thing, John? <laughs> Welcome to Stories of Briscoe and Bradshaw. Ah, we Bradshaw. Now? That would be your chicken shell native. Miss Briscoe, be quiet. This is the intro where I put you over. <laughs> Oklahoma's favorite son, Chicken Shaw Hall of Famer, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And we got the Hall of Fame referee, Mr. James Beard, and the man who perpetrated the greatest rip in the history of the world with a greased pole and Mike Graham, the flamboyant one, <laughs> Eric Embry. And we're talking about Texas Cowboys and Texas wrestling. Mr. Briscoe, this is your favorite topic because it's God bless Texas. How did I get in this damn conversation anyway, man? If it wasn't for me and Eric, there'd be no Texas wrestling. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Eric, I'm glad you're joining us because now I'm not no outnumbered by these damn two Texans, man. That work, work, working with Texans, as you know, you unfortunately had to live there for a while. You know, I escaped all that <laughs> and just fly over. Every time I'd fly over, I'd wait all the way from Florida, get over to the state of Texas, Tell the captain to slow down just a little bit, go over uh, Sweetwater, Texas, and let me do my business in the in the laboratory and flunk <laughs> it out. And he did, man, every time. <laughs> <laughs> and you know how that airline food is, man. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, uh, I, 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 I agree with you, Jerry, but I love Texas. What a great Eric, time. Eric, Eric, oh, Eric, oh, Eric. Oh, what, a, what a great time I had there those three or four years. But you're the one that put me on the wrestling map, Jerry Briscoe, and I will never, ever forget it. So I'm on your side. Well, thank you very much. You, you know, and, and even though it's about Texas, Eric, and, and James, we're going to have a good time talking about this stuff, you know. I've been, uh, I, and I can't, I, I, please uh, don't, nobody in Oklahoma take this seriously, but I had to research Texas a little bit uh, last night today. So, <laughs> you know, and not only was my house full of magazine and I was getting called JBL one time, I did, I don't think we've told this story, but one time I said, I started getting all these calls, guys, from, from the state. Every time I get home, and they seem to know exactly when I get home from the from a road trip i go to the body shop briscoe brothers body shop most famous body shop in the world i go to the body shop my my office manager say jerry there, there's this person over there from texas they got it said they got to talk to you i get on there mr briscoe this is so and so from richardson texas we got a great community out here we think you'd fit right in what do you mean? Well, we got a retirement home out there. We know you're here in that age where you're looking for some place to go. You know, we have a we have the perfect place for you and your lovely wife. I said, no, thank you. This <laughs> went on for weeks and weeks and weeks, man. Weeks. <laughs> they wouldn't let me go. Finally, one day I said, ma'am, <laughs> Oklahoma, I, if I retire, I damn sure ain't going to retire in the state of Texas there. I'm from Oklahoma. Don't call me no more. Go Cowboys, and that was it, man. <laughs> and then, then after that, I started getting these damn Texas Monthly magazines. And I get them every month. So finally, we're having a family reunion at my house here. My family comes in. My wife liked them because in the back of them, there, there's recipes, you know. And I got to admit, there's some good food out in Texas, you know. So we, we stole some recipes. So, and most of those recipes were so from the Indian nation, so they were actually <laughs> to begin with. So my, I, I had to here comes my brothers, my sisters, my mom was alive at the time. Gerald, what in the world are you doing with all these Texas magazines on there? I said I got them like you know, like Playboy magazine. You got them for the articles. Well, I got them for the recipes. And so I went to John. Oh no, Mister Brad, these things are are cheap. You know, they're like hundred dollars. You know, for the subscription. And so finally, I went to John, and John and Ron sitting in the dressing room, and I said, "John, I'm getting all these damn magazines. I don't know where they're coming from." And I could see the look on his face there. You know, he's kind of, kind of, kind of trying. Oh, I don't know, Mister Bush. I don't know where they're coming from. I said, "Well, I don't know either." And, I, and so, uh, so I turn and I walk out, but I hide behind the corner. And Ron looks at John and says, "Damn, what's he so hot about?" John starts laughing. <laughs> 
I subscribed him to a 10 year supply subscription. <laughs> and, about, and I picked my head out. You son of a bitch, I caught you, man. <laughs> dude, I said, dude, that guy, Ron said, damn, John, he got it, man. <laughs> John, was, John was just trying to prep you for this interview. So you'd have yeah, all that. Right. <laughs> Eric, I signed him up for every magazine I could find. It cost me a fortune. I signed him up for every Texas magazine you could get and sent him to his house. Well, one thing I learned, and, and, Texas, and it took me, a battle. That Texas never won a battle. You know, the Comanches kicked their ass every time. The Mexicans <laughs> kicked their ass every time. They never won a battle, you know. <laughs> and Eric, it took a, it was a lot of effort to get him signed up for that retirement home, allegedly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I went down there and told him, so I've got this relative. He's just a wonderful man. He's going to be a little hard to deal with, but you got to deal with him because he really wants to come here. So when he leaves, he's going to tell you he's not interested, but keep calling him because he really wants to come here, okay? Wow. So every time wow. he'd tell them that he wasn't interested, they'd call me. He said he's not interested. I said, oh, no, that's just him being him. Just keep calling him. <laughs> See what uh, I do for you, Mr. That, Briscoe? That's just working with Texas. You know how it is, Eric. That's how we're working to Texas. Is. But anyway, let's get on with this damn great podcast we got going today. Man, it's going to be fun, even though it is Texas. <laughs> so uh, the uh, the history of Texas wrestling, the history of five, what, five territories in the state of Texas. There was uh, Mr. Guerrero's down in El Paso, Mr. Blanchard's down in San Antonio, the Funks up in Amarillo, the Von Erichs in Dallas, and Paul Bosch down in Houston. So that was the main territories. And there wasn't another territory, was there, James or Eric, besides those five that ran, maybe some independence, but those that was yeah, it. Well, te technically, Houston wasn't really a territory. It was just a promotion. It was actually – actually, the booking office was still in Dallas, but Paul just kind of did what he wanted to do. But then at some point, uh, Paul and Fritz split, right? Uh, I think so, but Derek probably knows more about that than I do, but – not not a whole lot. I know they had a big falling out, and Fritz decided he's just gonna run it on his own. That back when he had the boys were hot, uh, he could about he could about run any city he wanted to on his own. Back when the boys were hot, <laughs> hey, yeah, they, that's they were, what they, John and uh, John and I were were talking about earlier when we we're doing some research, you know. And you know, I I was doing the research. I just found out. You know, Dallas wasn't a big territory. It was Dallas, basically. But you guys kept busy. And John said, you guys were working every night. And and I holy cow, uh, the effort that it takes and, and the promotional skill that it takes when you got your one major town, you got your TV, and you're keeping the boys busy every night because the boys aren't going to come to a territory just work one night. They got to be busy seven nights a week, six nights a week back in those days. But right. to have those high school, uh, high school gyms and those armories Woo. and those civic centers going every night, not only running but packing it out, and the guys were making super money. So, guys, John, the trips had had to be nice trip. And Eric, you, you, you and James can speak for this. The trip there, your 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 trip, your mileage that for the week had to be zero almost. A lot, a lot, a lot of times, uh, Ed Watt uh, sold tickets and worked in the office and. Uh, back when I got there, Ed promoted all of the spot shows. And, uh, you know, so, uh, it, th that trend was kind of dying when I got there. But there were some weeks that we didn't travel over 200 miles working seven times. Wow. Well, wasn't, that, wasn't that part of your deal, though, Eric? Didn't you, didn't you want to get involved in the spot show somehow? I, I, I did. I, I uh, made a deal with Fritz and uh, anyway, long story short, the deal I approached him with was we split it. Uh, he front the money to run the town and we split the profit 50, 50 or split the loss 50, 50. And he said, nobody has ever offered me any kind of deal like that. That fair. You have my permission to go run any town you want to run and I'll do it with you. Wow. My first town I ran was Waco, Texas, a, a little over twenty some thousand dollars, and uh, it was like cha ching, cha ching. <laughs> what, what building did you run in Waco? The uh, uh, it was right outside of Waco. It was a big building. The heart of Texas, heart of Texas Arena. 
No, no. Because we used what, to what, it was it like? It was uh, the town. I can't think of the name of the town right there by Waco, where the military place is. Fort Hood. Fort Hood. Fort Hood. Back yeah. <laughs> Fort Hood. Yeah. Yes. The big, the big arena there, and uh, I went down and met with the radio station, and uh, they had a cocky DJ, and. Uh, he built it up and he had a match against Cowboy Tony, Tony Falk as a shoot. And uh, we just, we, it, we almost sold it out. It was almost packed. And that's when they, that's when they wasn't drawing any money anywhere then. Cowboy what, what was, by the way, James. <laughs> yeah, Tony, Tony Falk, I forgot about Tony doing that cowboy gimmick, man. It, yeah. Yeah, you know, he of, people, yeah, he came to me, James. He, he, what a great worker Tony was. Oh yes, he he come to me there at the building in the dressing room and said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa Eric, whoa, 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 what am I going to do? What am I? What am I going to do?" I said, "Well, either you're going to whoop him or you're going to get your ass whooped." And he <laughs> said, "Oh no, 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 no." Anyway, they they pulled it off good and. Uh, Tony Falk, I can't say enough good things about Tony. Yeah. I met Tony in San Antonio when they uh, – I, I kept Tony – with Tony with me every territory after that. I always brought Tony in. He what was a just great. a good guy, good what guy. You, you called him Cowboy Tony. Was he a real cowboy or was he like – <laughs> Where he just had a party pony that his mom got him for his birthday and he rode around on it. That's about what we did. He was a gay, man, a a gay cowboy. Gay cowboy. Rick, <laughs> yeah. Rick, was that your idea to put him on a bull at the, at the Mesquite Rodeo Arena? Yes. Yes, it was. It, uh, I thought it was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The loser rides the bull. And, uh, man, I, I had buddied up with Donnie Gay. And, uh, Tony got on that bull in the chute there. Was it and, a working uh, bull? No. <laughs> no. No, no, brother. And, and uh, the bull kept trying to jump out of the chute. And I looked over, and uh, one of the cowboys there at Mesquite was poking him with this little pen knife, poking the bull. <laughs> and I told him, I said, one more time. He did it again, and I kicked him right in the mouth. And Tony Tony got off the bull, and then a cowboy rode the bull. <laughs> That bull was hot, man. Yes, that it was. bull was hot. Now that that's that's one cowboy from Texas that we probably wouldn't have ever thought about if Eric hadn't brought it up. <laughs> cowboy Tony. <laughs> yeah, great guy, great guy, man. You know, I, I was talking to Jerry yesterday about it. You know, one of the things, the reasons that so many people think so highly of the Von Erics, not just because of their great name and what they did on television. Because they did they didn't know them. <laughs> <laughs> That was bad, but it's the truth. <laughs> but they, you ran so many shows in so many towns in such a concentrated era area that almost everybody at some point, if they're wrestling fans, ran into one of the Von Erics. Either at the gym, they got a, you know, they used to sign autographs and, and take pictures before matches. But they were in every single town, so everybody you talked to that was around back then that were wrestling fans, they'll have a picture with the Von Erics. You know, I yes. think that's cr contributed to a lot of the lasting legacy, the fact that they just met so many people. Yes, yes. They they were out there and in, in their, you know, there's there's some hard feelings between me and there. But uh, in their defense, in their time period, they were over like rock stars there in Dallas. And then things started happening that uh, – you, you know, but I really, I really think their popularity was due to what John said. They were everywhere. You know, that's that's the old school promoters' uh, mo. You know, get your guys out in public. You you got a great, a bunch of great young, good looking athletes. Eddie Graham did it here. You know, uh, other promoters, uh, Jim Crockett, uh, senior, used to do it up in Carolina. He used to get you out out to high school. You know, you run in the high school. Is usually an association with a fundraiser for a wrestling team or a football team. Get you with those kids out there. You're building that fan base. That that's a, it's that old school promotion. That's what I I bring it up there in the beginning. The effort that you know you run in one major town, but yet you're keeping the boys busy the other six days a week by getting them out there. 
but you're also exposing your product and your athletes to the masses out there. And that's that's what I think that's what really helped the territories grow in those days. That's exactly right. Exactly right. And Eric, you were you were in the middle of all that transition from you from world class <laughs> to and, and you know, I get people asking me all the time what happened. You know, I was gone a lot. I was in Japan a lot, but but uh, uh you know, can you I mean what happened? I mean, really, what what was the deal there? Could Jerry Jarrett told me one time himself, so several years later, that 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 was his favorite time in the business, and I I thought he'd hate it, but he he was he, he was really high on it for some reason. Well, you thought he hated it because it was Texas. I mean, I can understand. That. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I, I've told this story before, so in a condensed version. Fritz made the uh, uh, smartest deal for him, he, for him in the history of wrestling. Uh, Ken Mantell took over with his, uh, I can't remember what they call Wild West Wrestling. He was running opposition. So he went in with Fritz uh, for on a 50-50 deal on the profit. Ken took over, but Ken assumed 100% of any losses. So he had a run. He had a go of it there for a while and uh, never really got it going. And uh, Fritz uh, Carey is uh, Kevin says, I set the deal up. I had, I didn't even know about the deal till it was done. Carey called Jerry Jarrett, met with Jerry Jarrett. Jerry flew to Texas, went out to Fritz's house and Fritz, uh, made him the offer and uh, told him that uh, if he took the deal, he wasn't as smart as Fritz thought Jerry was. You should definitely not take this deal. But Jerry took the deal. Jerry had 51%. He had control. Kevin and Kerry had the other 49. And uh, we were off and running. Uh, Jerry stayed there a few days. And we set it up. Uh, Gary Hart left because him and Jerry had problems in Atlanta before and so forth. I took over the book completely. And uh, we were just, uh, we took off and uh, uh, had, had a great run. We got all the towns up. We were doing business. And uh, the the final straw, well, one, the, the name change happened from world class to USWA because Kevin's lawyers uh, gave Jerry a cease and desist order, uh, could no longer use the world class name after a certain period of time, six, eight, 10 weeks, whatever it was. And Jerry uh, presented that to me and I said, well, we go with a name change angle. Give me time to think we'll become the USWA. We'll merge Memphis and Dallas together, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we did that. And uh, uh, the the ending came. I, I had left after the PY, uh, Phil Hickerson, PY Chu High, and my blow off to change the name. I stayed another few weeks, but uh, I was burned out. It was time to take a break. And I went home to Florida, and uh, Jerry started booking himself. And uh, that's when Kevin hit him with a lawsuit on uh, he had cheated them out of their territory, even though he had the contract, blah, blah, blah. And Jerry's lawyers told Jerry, and all this is coming straight from Jerry Jarrett's mouth to me. His lawyers told him that this lawsuit is a no-brainer. We can beat it hands down. No problem. But Jerry, if we beat this lawsuit, you're still partners with Kevin and Kerry. And Jerry said, wow. And he decided that he would rather just pack his bags and go back to Tennessee than to continue the partnership with more Kevin than Kerry. Kerry and Jerry were okay. Kevin hated Jerry Jarrett from day one. And I really don't know why. Other than I do think I might know, because Gary Hart, and I loved Gary, 
but Gary and Jerry Jarrett had had mega trouble in Atlanta when Jerry came in to book Atlanta for, uh, can't think of the guy's name, used to have uh, the gay the gay promoter. Jim Barnett. Jim Barnett. Jim Barnett. Yeah. When Jerry came in to book for him, uh, he overheard Gary Hart talking in the bathroom and da-da-da, and Jerry fired him, and that heat went back to then. So in my mind, I'm really sure that Gary Hart dogged Jerry Jarrett to Kevin when this deal happened, and Kevin loved Gary Hart, and I think that's where the heat originally started and built from. And hey, Eric, you know something funny about that story? I was there at the time. I wasn't in the locker room, but Gary hated Tennessee, and what what's ironic? Gary was blasting Jared. You know, all those gimmick matches they work in Tennessee not going to work here. We ain't going to have all these. But Gary was known for gimmick matches himself. That, that's <laughs> all, that was always yeah. what was so hilarious to me about it. Gary Gary knocking the exact game plan that Gary used. You know, me in a cage, or you know, yeah. Gary, you beat Sporter, you get five minutes with me in a cage, or something like that. But that right. was carried them over with that. But that. That's really what it was, and and, uh, and Jared overheard uh, 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 Gary talking to Jim Barnett and knocking knocking the Memphis style of uh, Tennessee style of of work and booking, and so that's yeah. really what all that was out. My question is, Bill Watts. I've known him all my life, basically since I was twelve years old, and Bill. That was always Bill's dream was to have Oklahoma and also have Dallas and Houston, where he finally ended up going into Houston, but he was never able to penetrate Dallas as far as I know. But that that was always his – I wondered how he got left out of that shuffle when when uh, when they were looking to make the sale and it ended up in, in Jared's hands. Well, I, I never heard his name mentioned. Uh, I never heard any, any other person's name mentioned when Kerry approached Jerry Jarrett and come back to Fritz with uh, Jerry is very interested and would like to talk to you <clears throat> because basically Fritz uh, told Ken Mantel, uh, you know, it, I'm taking it back. And uh, then after, I don't know, wasn't very long. Uh, he told Kevin and Kerry that he had put his last penny into Dallas. You can close it down. You can do whatever you want. I'm through with it. That's when Kerry went to Jerry Jarrett and struck up the deal. I'm surprised Gary Hart didn't jump in at that time, too. I mean, uh, it's close. I don't think Gary, Gary didn't have the money. Uh, I Gary, didn't have what it was. That's what I figured. He just didn't have the dollars to do he it. Didn't have the dollars. Yeah. Well, Gary and I had actually talked about it. And uh, take us through a typical week there in Dallas, you know, the, the, your your trips and, 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 and your town that you had to do. A typical week. Now, when I first got there, uh, business was horrible. I mean, uh, uh, it was so bad <clears throat> that I stayed, uh, you know, I, I went there as a favor to, to Brody. And uh, after two months, probably, uh, I decided that was it. And I went to Gary Hart's apartment and uh, to tell Gary bye. And... Uh, he said, no, no. He goes, we got to go to the Sportatorium. And I said, I'm not going to Sportatorium. I'm going home to Florida. And uh, he said, well, I'm not getting out of your van. I said, well, you're going to Florida then. And uh, I went to the Sportatorium. We went upstairs and met with Fritz. And uh, Fritz, uh, that br bruiser was booking with Buck Robley helping him. And uh, Fritz bitched at me a little bit for screwing up his and Gary's plan. And the plan was Gary was going to take over next week or something. And, uh, with me working with him and, uh, he said, now I have to do this deal right now if you'll stay. And, uh, I said, I'll try it. And, uh, that's how we got Gary and I got the book back there. I stayed up in Fritz's office. Gary went downstairs and fired, uh, Brody and Robley. And uh, we, we took over. Brody, I thought him and Brody were pals at that time. Yeah, but, you know, uh, money makes money a difference calls. in a lot of ways. How, how did Brody take getting fired after he brought brought you in and then you you fired him? 
<laughs> you know, he, he kind of, I thought it was going to be a problem, but he kind of <laughs> snickered at me and, uh, he, and, and wished me good luck. I think it was a relief to him to get him out of that situation there that he didn't know how to get out of himself. That's yep. what I really think happened. That, that's what I've been told myself that he, he was, he was glad that it was over with. Yeah. Really yeah. Were you there during this period? No, no, no. I don't think so. Well, you were, you were obviously probably hearing about it. What was your thoughts going on? Was you, was you upset with Fritz when you left or what, what was your, what did you do when you left it? You talked to me? No. Well, I, I mean, it, it was like Eric said, everything was a mess in Dallas then. You know, it was, it was so bad. T attendance was down and 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 morale was down everything you know they tried everything they could i think uh bruiser bruiser was kind of a last resort kind of deal to to mm -hmm. do something with it and i think uh david man bruiser, bruiser was proven money there that's the reason gary brought him back in right because he was proven commodity for us there so. yeah fritz but, fritz brought him back in fritz brought him in and gave him the book well hey, yeah. eric was it something like the dog that caught the car you know, Brody was this great talent. And sometimes when you're a great talent, they just assume that you want to be a booker and do more. Was that kind of what it was with Brody that he was like this great talent and all of a sudden he gets this job he doesn't really want and he kind of wanted to go back to being just the talent? Yes, yes. And that's when, you know, he brought in Buck Robley. And, uh, you know, at one time, Buck Robley was a hell of a booker. At one and time, Buck was what, probably one of the best in the business. Yeah, but he it was he never he well, never that time was though is when he had watch looking over his shoulder all the time. And, and yes, yes. He never got it going there, you know. I hadn't been around uh Buck for a long time. And uh it, it was surprising me, like wow, he he's lost it. You know, his mind his mind just wasn't there like it I had known it being there before. <clears throat> and uh so then, you know, uh, and I think I'm remembering correctly that when I first got there and stuff, those few weeks, uh, $300 a week was uh, about it. You know, we, we, we wasn't making, there wasn't nobody making any money. And Fritz had to be losing a ton of money. And, uh, well, hell, even uh, uh, the rent for the sportatorium was so far behind that the old man uh, crossed the little creek there in that other building, I can't think of his name, that owned it, was uh, ready to tell Fritz to go home after all those years. And uh, Jerry wrote, and I, I Jerry wrote him a 20 or 30, I can't remember, you know, hell, 30-some years ago. <laughs> but uh, Jerry, when we went and met with him, uh, Jerry wrote him a check for all the back rent. And... Uh, we made a new deal with him for a dollar per person, no matter what we did, no matter how many times we ran a week or whatever. So it, the rent on the sportatorium cost us a dollar a ticket for Friday nights and uh, Saturday morning TV that we filmed for Channel 11 for Fort Worth. And uh, things just started falling together, you know, uh, Jerry was the savior, you know, he paid all the back bills and buddy, there was a lot of money for, it was way behind. Uh, I, I, I tell you, I, I'm, and I'm not saying this was because Eric's here, but yeah, Eric, you are. <laughs> Eric, did, <laughs> Eric did something that I didn't think was possible. He brought, he brought it back from the dead. And, and, uh, man, I tell you what, it was, it was a, a, a miracle really. And, and it's all because that guy right there sitting right there, he did it. I'm telling you, did you, I, I, Jerry, I, Jerry, I, Jerry, Eric, Eric, what was your philosophy right. to bring that back? I mean, what, 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 how did you revive it? Cause there's, you know, there's, there's several methods and, and all of them are proven, but your, your method there in Dallas was certainly what Dallas needed. How, how what type of matches and talent did you, did you produce? Well, it uh, was simple in my mind. The people were, and, and you know, Mike Von Eric killed himself uh, two or three weeks after I had got there. You know, and uh, that that was another uh, takeaway from the Von Erics. In my mind, the people, the fans for that time period 
had only seen the Von Erichs pushed hard. And uh, I, I knew that I could not put a Von Erich on top and draw money. And Jerry Jarrett came to me, and, and I didn't want to push myself. Uh, any good booker knows not to push their self. But Jerry Jarrett came to me, and he was having trouble with Kevin on the business end and stuff. And he said, hey, I don't know which way you're going. And my God, what a free hand he gave me. He stayed out of my booking unless I called him and asked him a question or his opinion. And uh, he said, I've got you. He goes, you're going to have to get you a top baby face other than a Von Eric." And I said, yes, Jerry, we're thinking on the same lines. He said, but it's got to be somebody we can trust. And uh, I said, well, I've got a couple people in mind, but I, I just, I'm not sure. He said, who is the person you can trust most on the face of the earth? I said, my mother. He said, besides your mother. <laughs> and uh, Did your mother said, work? Well, no, no. <laughs> but that's that's the person I trusted most on the face of the earth. And uh, I said, well, that would be, I would trust myself. He said, then go with that. And I said, no, no. He said, no, I'm telling you, go with you. It's okay. And now I'd come into the territory as, is he gay or is he not gay? Bleach blonde heel went from that character to, in my mind, for a time period, replacing the Von Erichs. But I didn't do it on my own, by all means. I surrounded myself with some super-duper talent, and I had Bronco Lubitsch, who had seen everything that had ever been done there in the Sportatorium, and Akbar. I had those two guys I could go to and pick their brains, and I, I surrounded myself with the right mixture of talent and we shot some angles and it took off and we went back to working snug, uh, almost, uh, working a shoot to where when you went out to the floor by the ring side, if you didn't knock the piss out of each other, then you wasn't working next week. Jerry, I, I, the, people asked me about all that back then. And, and, and the best way I can describe it is, is Eric, became stone cold before stone cold really i mean he yeah, was he stole, he stole all my stuff he, <laughs> he <lost it>. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah and, and it worked that's the thing you know to, uh, for another example since you brought steve up you know steve went through the school blah 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 chris adams and uh so i i made uh jerry give me steve uh back and uh i made chris adams uh, I had to shoot with Chris to cut him out of the school where Steve was paying him 50 bucks uh, a week to train him. I said, you either cut him loose and let me start booking him or I'm going to go to him and book him anyway. So you can save face, Chris. And Chris and me were buddies from Mexico and stuff. Got along great. And uh, I explained to Chris, I'm going to shoot the angle with the two girls and Steve and you. I said, but, and I got and explained to Steve and Chris together. I said, you know, Steve had been a heel fan in the heel section at the Sportatorium for a long time. I said, everybody in the damn building knows him, knows who he is. So, Chris, no matter what, he cannot out wrestle you ever, ever in any way, fashion, shape, or form. He has got to heel, heel, heel when he takes over. If you let him out wrestle you in any move, then program's over. I'll go a different route. And they did that, and damn, Steve just started clicking. Was he, he getting over? Was I mean, how long was Steve been in a business at that point? A year or so? No. Hell no. He was, he, he was still in the school. He was still in the school, and, but uh, I thought he was out in Tennessee when he brought he went to He went to Tennessee for a little bit uh, to kind of – get some of the greenness off if you could right. and uh then came back and shot the he was just one of those natural texas hills then yes and he was really dating steve's ex-wife mm -hmm. and steve's ex-wife and his wife were the best you couldn't be any closer than those two were so it was all four of them just working uh it, it, it just clicked it clicked and took off and uh after I left, it was about the only thing they had 
that they could rehash and go with. But well, it, it really, you have to walk us through what I mean. We really wasn't at a stone cold gimmick because he developed that later. But what 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 kind of gimmick? Just aggressive, kick ass heel. Is that what he was? Yeah, yeah. Just a, a cocky, good looking, long blonde hair, super body, and uh, just just that that local fan that come out of the crowd and I mean, became. Now, that, that's really intriguing to me because I've seen that happen a lot of times. A lot of times it don't, don't work because it don't work. As well yep. him, but you, for somehow you made it work. You and Steve, the, the combination of the two made it work. What were the ingredients in just, just uh, your mind and Steve work or a combination of both? A combination of both. And, uh, if Steve had tried to out wrestle in, in a working sense, if Steve had out wrestled Chris, the people would have chanted bullshit, bullshit. But Chris would out wrestle him hands down, boom, boom, boom. And then Steve would uh, nut shot him or poke him in the eye. And then he would start healing. Never, ever did Steve try to out wrestle Chris Adams. Because he couldn't, and the people in the bleachers knew he couldn't, or knew he wasn't supposed to, <laughs> you know, wasn't supposed to be able to. So <laughs> it just made him a super heel, a super heel, a cheating son of a gun, dirty you know, low life. Eric, you know, one thing about this is the education that Stone Cold got from this. You know, a lot of guys break in the business, and, and you're just trying to learn how to put matches together. What Steve was learning was psychology was here's this yeah. great wrestler and Chris Adams, who's, who's very much over don't out wrestle him because he's the established wrestler, be a heel. You know, a lot of guys don't get that early in their career. And I, you know, I don't know what, what happens these days. I, I, Cause I'm not in the anywhere near the scene of, you know, guys starting except when I go down to, you know, say NXT down in uh, Orlando, but there, you don't have so many guys don't have that educational background of, Here's what you're doing, why you're doing it. Here's how to get started. It's just mm -hmm. an unbelievable learning experience uh, for Stone Cold to start like that. Yes, yes. Yeah. Exactly he, he, right, John. I mean, yeah, think of it. I mean, you're you're coming out of out, out of a wrestling school. All of a sudden you're put you're put in a, in the ring with your mentor who who who's already over as an established, really certified wrestler, you know, and then then you you know, you're 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 put in there and you're learning that psychology, which is a, so valuable at, at a young age. There and, and Steve was getting that, and you can almost see see why Steve was so successful later on in his career by by having all that uh, that philosophy fed to him at an early age. There, I think that's a fantastic story. The the, the other the other part of that too is that, that Steve kind of had that natural feel for things. He, he was a he just had a natural feel oh, yeah, in the room. Yeah. Some yeah. guys just don't have that, and and he also some of the, one of the, part of the thing I saw in John too later on is that he was willing to sit down and learn and and train and 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 figure it out. He was he was interested in the psychology as much as he was the physical part of it. And yeah, that's uh, probably the key right there, somebody that's really going to listen and then take what he's hearing and apply it in in the ring. Because a lot of times and, you you yeah. sit there, and I mean, all four of us have done is sit there with with a young man our young lady and, and tell them, tell them your philosophy. Then you see them go out to the ring and there's nothing that you will relay to them that, that happens. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times Steve would come over to my house and all he'd want to do is sit and watch film and, and, and study. And, and that's the kind of, that's the kind of mindset he had about learning, you know, and, and that, that made a big difference. And, and, and that's why he became what he became. You know, years later, Steve and I were uh, in the Saturday night main event on NBC in a beer drinking contest. <laughs> and they, gave, they brought this big script to Steve and he's sitting there with me. And as they left and he walked out, he goes, are, are you doing any of this? And I said, Steve, I'll do whatever you want. You know, that's stone cold. You know, what are you going to do? I mean, that's, you know, he's by that point, he's already <laughs> You know, one of, if not the biggest name in, in the history of wrestling. And so I, I said, whatever you want. He said, we'll just go off field. I said, I'll play off you. I have no doubt. You know, he's so cold. It's going to be fine. And sure enough, we go out there and Steve, just the crowd was going nuts for him. And he went a million different directions. They all made sense, but it was all 100% feel with him. And, and by the way, he hits me with a, a pitcher of beer at the end. 
and it slips out of his hand. It was glass and it, and it busts my nose. My, my nose is all bloody coming back. I come back and Vince McMahon is yelling at me. He goes, I told you no contact whatsoever. You got a bad back. He's got a bad neck. And Vince is yelling at me. I go, wait a minute. I'm the <laughs> dartboard. I didn't hit myself. <laughs> <laughs> course, Steve is, oh, sorry about the nose. Sorry, that was great. Uh, yeah. And then, Vince, that's great, Steve. Good thing. Good thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, exactly. Hey, Eric, you know, one thing about it is, you know, you say you trust yourself, but that's the reason that a lot of promoters push their sons, right? I mean, because not just because of nepotism, but because you, they know they're not going to screw them, or at least least less likely to screw they them. Leave they know they ain't leaving. <laughs> that's right. They ain't leaving. Exactly right. That's right. That's right. The, uh, you know, when uh, they did the deal with Jerry and I had the book and da da da, the Chris and Austin thing, we ran a, a yearly big show. And what's the name of that arena, James? The Out Cot Cotton Bowl? Yeah, Cotton Bowl. Yeah, Cotton Bowl. And uh, I had started mingling uh, uh, Sportatorium with, uh, Jerry Lawler, Bill Dundee, Jimmy Valiant. Uh, I started uh, mingling these talents and talking the Texas versus Tennessee, starting that up. And uh, I was with Jeff Jarrett uh, at the Cotton Bowl. I can't remember. I think Kerry was maybe with Lawler. And uh, I don't remember exactly. But I almost made the save in Kerry's match at the cotton bowl to gauge the people, to gauge the reaction. Uh, it's not like Kerry was down and out and, uh, uh, you know, just, uh, I come, if I hadn't have came, he would have died, uh, a regular save, but I come and, uh, then, uh, we, we fed a Tennessee guy and then with another Texas guy and then boom and boom. And so then we had Texas on one side, Tennessee on the other, and we kind of left it hanging. And then I went to uh, Sportatorium TV and uh, did a promo to where, uh, you know, I didn't come to help the Von Erics. I came to help Texas. And uh, but if a Von Eric ever needs anything from me, all they have to do is ask that clicked. And then in a tag match, uh, Kerry's partner got hurt, and I came down, got in the corner. Kerry gave me the hot tag. Boom, we were off and running with Texas versus Tennessee and uh, never looked back. Tojo came in, then the, uh, the angle for the control of the company with the board of directors and Max Andrews. I mean, I would set up Friday night after the matches while it was all good and fresh, I never slept on a Friday night. I would write Saturday morning TV every, and I don't mean just here or there, every Friday night up in that little office at the top of the Sportatorium. Yeah, that was a big change when they started doing TV on Saturday mornings, too. You know, we weren't yeah. used to that. That was, that was different. Yep, yep. It had to be an asset. I know here in Tampa, you know, they'd have Tampa on uh, Tuesday night, and you'd follow it right up Wednesday morning with Wednesday morning TV. So you yeah. were able, you had that fresh memory in your mind. You were able to take what happened Tuesday night and just jam it into the the, the weekly show there. So that, that was brilliant thinking there. So mm -hmm. Eric, uh, the thing started popping again. How long was your run this time, Eric? How, how did it go? And what were, what was the starting the the the, the downside of it? Where did you peak, and where where did the other side? Come? Well. I, uh, the, the the downside was gone. We were on a roll. Everybody was making. Oh yeah, money. but after after you're on a roll, what happened after that one? I I, th I think I finally just burned out. Uh, and uh, Jerry and I had a couple arguments over uh, really nothing ra wrestling wise, not not the wrestling business. Uh, he got real mad at me because I wouldn't answer the phone one day when he was calling and Percy come over to the house and said, Jerry Jarrett's calling you. I said, hell, I know, but I ain't talking to him right now. And uh, so, it, you know, uh, and that was just a very few, very few weeks after the blow off of changing the name and where I'm trying to 
uh, figure out where do we go from here? Do I rekindle PY? Do I rekindle Gary Young and me? Uh, where do I go from here? And finally, the wife talked me into, I know where I need to go from here before I don't have a home. I'm going home to Florida. And, Did you uh, ever think about having a financial interest in, in the company there? Were you no, no, no. I, I was making very, very, very good money and uh, uh, never asked about it. Uh, to give you an idea on the, the just the syndication end, uh, Jerry Jarrett and Max Andrews had a salary of 10 grand a piece weekly. So they were clearing at least 20 grand a week. Plus they divvied up the profits at the end of the physical year. And uh, when, when I hit them, hit them with that, I got a nice, uh, uh, a nice uh, raise, I guess you would call it. My checks went up tremendously. And to be honest, Jerry Lawler's the one that stooged that to me. <laughs> I didn't know we were doing that well on syndication. <laughs> where was all the syndication? Where, where were you all making money? Where, where was the TV that were getting so much money from? From the yep. Friday night, fr the Friday night uh, sportatorium TV was syndicated, syndicated and Max Andrews had taken over the syndication, and uh, I couldn't tell you all the places it went everywhere. I was you know, told over two hundred of them. Yeah, and how many? How many? You know, what was the number? Over two hundred different markets, James. Right. Yeah. Hey, Eric, it, what, is, is this nationwide, worldwide, or what? It was nationwide. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure it went overseas too. But yeah, nationwide. Eric, were you guys making money off Israel TV? The syndication. Hey, the reason I say it, you know, the, the, the Von Erichs became massive stars in Israel. And the story I was told was somebody had bootlegged the tape to begin with. And then the, the TV show took off in Israel. And all of a sudden, you know, it's kind of crazy. You know, seems like kind of a random country on, you know, halfway around the world that is carrying the television and the product became so hot. You know, they showed up, you know, famously the airport shut down, the city shut down because they were such big stars. Were you guys making money off that point in Israel? And was there any imp emphasis <laughs> on the Israeli television? I honestly don't know an answer to that because that was back when, before me. But when you uh, were there, you didn't have it. You didn't have Israel or no? Well, we had uh, Fritz had the Christian Broadcasting Network. That's how he got originally syndicated everywhere, by playing on that uh, CBN. And uh, now whether, when Max took over uh, the syndication, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, but, you know, I do know, too, because when we did the write-in campaign to reinstate Eric Embry when Dusik fired me uh, and we did a shoot write-in campaign, we would get all kinds of letters from Israel and overseas and stuff. So our TV was still playing over there, yes. Was there talk of, you know, they had Super Clash uh, 1, 2, and 3, where the territories were trying to kind of make a combined effort to combat what was coming out of New York. Was there an uh, emphasis in Texas as well that you thought maybe we need to partner with Tennessee, we need to get some type of breadth uh, and width about us, to combat what's coming out of New York with the national television deals that were starting to happen. Cause we got, Blanchard got it first, the USA network and then Vince ended up buying the, the USA network. And then WTBS went with the sale of Georgia championship wrestling to Vince. So Vince now has got the two big national TV contracts. Was there a thought of you guys thinking maybe we need to partner with AWA, maybe we need to partner with Tennessee to combat what's coming in that wave. Well, the uh, the the Texas Tennessee combined, you know, you've got the same promoter owns both places now, and that all happened because of Kevin's attitude. Because uh, I mean, completely, you know, when we got served with the cease and desist order that Jerry did not buy the world class name. The Von Eric still owned the world class name, and we have to stop using it. I put all that angle together, boom, boom, and merged it in with the USWA. 
back in the uh, super class day where I never got paid for still either. And I think Lawler said he didn't get paid. Uh, that was, uh, I never heard or was in on discussions about let's re let's unite and beat Vince because we had Dallas on fire and uh, it was more of a Vern Gagne talking Jerry Jarrett into doing the promotion with him. I don't know how, you know, Jerry and Vern go back, but I'm sure they dealt for years together. And uh, Vern was petri not petrified, uh, was scared to death that Vince was going to take over his place also. And uh, this maybe could be the start of uh, uh, showing Vince he can't do it. Was there so, any talk in Texas when, uh, say, Blanchard starts going down in San Antonio or the Funks quit promoting in Amarillo? Was there any talk in Texas of taking over these other territories? And not, not when I was there, uh, but the, when I was in Dallas, it, it was years later than all this happening. Uh, I was in San Antonio Southwest for Blanchard for two or three years, and uh, – that was after he had done broke off and uh, started his own territory down there and uh, had a good run for a long time. But uh, what happened to Joe was, uh, I don't know how to say it without being ugly. Every successful promoter is not a nice guy. Every successful promoter that I'm aware of always made the right decisions, did the right thing, no matter who or how it hurt someone, they made the right decisions to protect their business. And if it put Joe Blow out of a job that had just had uh, uh, triplet babies or what, it didn't, it, not that it didn't matter to them, it's they had uh, the intestinal fortitude to make the right decision for the business, not keep him here uh, just because he's a good guy. And most successful promoters wasn't uh, really good friends, good friends with the talent. That makes sense. Well, you're exactly right. I can testify that I worked for two or three guys that, that it really Eddie Graham, for instance, he didn't care who you were, if you weren't drawing money for you, you were gone. gone. Yeah. Jim Crockett, Jim Crockett Sr., same thing. I mean, he made decisions some guy at times that a guy would be over so good, but there was just something about the guy that Jim Crockett Sr. didn't didn't trust or didn't feel right about, and the guy was gone immediately. Why is he gone so quick? You know, well, it had to do with Jim Crockett Sr. Hey, Jerry, you know, how, would Eddie, how would Eddie – How would Eddie Graham – Watt was the same thing, as you know. Hey, Jerry, how would Eddie Graham feel if uh, some new guy came in and uh, greased up a pole and destroyed his son's push? Um, <laughs> He'd get mighty, mighty upset about it until he found out it was a Jack Briscoe behind him. <laughs> <laughs> and that was his money tree, so he wasn't going to get too upset. <laughs> it's funny well, how the person that does the rib, all of a sudden the rib becomes funny. It's no longer, hey, you can't do that. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know when that Mike came back and his arms were like Popeyes, man. <laughs> we're trying to rear, go up that grease pole. That Eric called his all grease, man. <laughs> I did it on my own because the Briscoes was going to whoop my ass if I didn't do it. <laughs> what was the negotiation like with the Briscoes backstage, Eric? There wasn't no negotiating. They, they said, it sure would be funny if that little – Son of a gun couldn't make it up that pole. Somebody all <laughs> the pole. And, don't, and I said, yeah, somebody get fired too or get hurt. And I uh, said, well, and basically Jack, Jack said in so many words as Jack would say, well, you know what's good for you. You'll make it happen. And I said, yes, sir. I'll make it happen, buddy. <laughs> God, he had the choice to either face an Eddie Graham or Jack Briscoe, and he made the right choice. <laughs> Jack was a lot closer. <laughs> I don't remember where I went in a couple of weeks, but I didn't last for a couple more weeks, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eric, 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 James, you know that story, right, James? Yes, yeah. I've heard that story. Yeah, yeah that that uh, 
I don't know if anybody could talk me into that, but it, you know, that, <laughs> Jack Bristol is looking at you real close. He gets yeah, up to you like this, right, I'm Eric? And he said, Eric, yeah. It'd be really funny if you did that. <laughs> yes, sir, Jack. <laughs> the funny thing is that I, I, I've never been a river, and I never knew Eric to be a river. Y'all must have really put some intimidation into it. Well, not y'all. Hey, Jack. Bro, bro. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It only took one. <laughs> Since when? <laughs> so, Eric, so Eric, Eric tell, tell us that. Okay, well, how, how did the end come there? You just, what what happened? What do you mean? The, how did the end come there in, in Dallas with you? Oh, I, I, I just, uh, I, I went home. I get, called Jerry and told him, and uh, I said, you know, what, I need what, to get what, down. What, what was the tipping point? The tipping point was uh, uh, extracurricular activities had got out of hand, <laughs> and uh, it was time to go home and straighten up and uh, uh, get get back on. Yeah, yeah. A lot of my buddies are not here anymore. I can't and, believe you mentioned extracurricular activities. Talking about <laughs> Dallas. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, really. Uh-huh. But well, man, let's, let's hit let's hit San Antonio a little bit. You know much about the start of San Antonio and then and what, what went on down there with Joe and, and that. I know you work down there and you you book down there also, right? <clears throat> yeah. I, I don't know the start other than uh after it started up and stuff, the boys in the different territories I was in everybody was talking about uh, Southwest and Joe Blanchard and how good the payoffs were and the money they were making. And uh, uh, I think, you know, at one time, everybody wanted to go to work for him there. I know we were losing a lot of people out of Florida to, to Joe. Yeah. It, uh, uh, hey, Eric, I, that, that was another, that was another easy territory with Crips and all that. Right. Yeah. My understanding was that, you know, Joe and Fritz had a pretty good relationship for a long time. And whatever happened, happened. And Joe just split off. He, he, he just went on down there and started his own thing. And evidently, it was some kind of disagreement or or, 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 or something that happened well, with two of them. I, I think politically, starting that right right in the middle of Dallas and, and, and Houston, was, was, was there political heat on on joe from both sides from paul and houston and from uh fritz and dallas uh, uh james do you know anything about that one i don't think from paul uh maybe from fritz but not from paul so much paul, joe, paul didn't care as long as people stayed out of houston yeah well, and, it, and he and joe had a good re working relationship so it, I, I never i never heard any, any kind of heat between those two well paul used all of all the guys in all the territories right james Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That, that was part of the Gary, Gary Hart told me one time that that was one of the things that was hardest for him when they were supposedly the booking office for Houston, but Paul was just kind of doing it on his own, you know, and, and, and he'd bring in guys from everywhere, you know, and, 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 uh, and, and that was kind of a frustration for Gary, you know, and, and, uh, but, but they were technically part of the Dallas booking office, but, but Paul was just, he was his own man. He just, he just booked his own promotion there and, and not much anybody could do about it because everybody wanted to work there. Was Joe following the same game plan basically too, or did he, he have his own crew in there that he didn't bring a lot of outsiders in or how, how did Joe book the territory? No, he, he, he had his own crews there. I, I, you know, I'd be flying somebody here or there, <clears throat> but he had his own, own crew there running and, I'm 99.9% .9 sure the fallout between Fritz and Joe uh, from Joe talking to me because Joe and I got very close to each other. And uh, it was the booking fee he was paying was going was going up. Fritz wanted more and more and more booking fee uh, using the boys and so forth. Uh, the. Uh, uh, on Joe running the towns, uh, it, it, there was a fight over the money where Fritz wanted more, and Joe said that uh, he decided to just do it on his own. Is what he had told me. I don't, I don't remember the percentages, the numbers, 
but it was the booking fee that uh, caused the big dispute. Eric, how, like, long you, how long did you have the pencil there, Eric? In San Antonio? Uh, I don't know. I would say almost, maybe a year, almost a year. It, it, uh, who did you follow and who, 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 who came out? <clears throat> Probably wasn't that long uh, a year. I followed Luke Williams, sheep herder. Right. You know, Luke had the territory on fire. When uh, you know we were flying, bringing in Carlos. I'm glad Ford. you said that because Luke don't get a lot of credit for his. Oh, time. Luke! Luke's he, a genius. He was a tremendous mother. He's a genius. He taught really? me so much. Luke right. is a genius. And uh, that's you know, interesting. He, you know, I, I know Luke really well. You know, from being around him. Uh, plus, we have mm -hmm. a, a running joke between uh, rugby and American football about which one's fixed and which one isn't. But. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I love I love Luke, you know, as, as everybody does. Nobody's ever said a bad word about him. But you're you're saying that he's not just a he was a genius. He was a genius, not just a booker. He was a genius, man. When I went there, then Luke come in, Jonathan Boyd. It was before Butch, and uh, when Luke took over, the place popped. I mean, oh my God, we were making money then, brother, and. Uh, uh, he would he would bring in different people. Uh, uh, Zabisco would fly in some. Abdullah, Carlos Colon. Uh, I, I can't remember all the names off the top of my head. That, uh, but we ran the Hemisphere Arena, and we were drawing thirty thousand dollar gates, thirty plus. And uh, when uh, I. I I figured out what Luke was doing after he did it, but uh, he was bringing in Carlos quite a bit and some of the Puerto Rican boys because when Luke left San Antonio, him and Butch, Butch had come by then, and him and Butch went to Puerto Rico for Luke to take over the book in Puerto Rico that was on its ass and popped it like a big dog. And uh, I went from... San Antonio, I went to two or three weeks, Mexico, and then I went to Puerto Rico for Luke. And uh, oh my gosh, I, I was having two, three thousand dollar weeks in Puerto Rico. And uh, to middle, to John, middle that, that when you're having those kind of weeks in Puerto Rico, uh, they're running those, those, those Coliseums, those baseball arenas, man. And yeah. There's 15,000, 20,000 people in there. Yes. Right. Yes, I mean, oh my gosh! And uh, then I took over the book for Luke when he left there, and uh, Carlos gave me the book to follow in Luke's Luke's past. And uh, uh, business fell a little bit, but it still stayed red hot for a while. Hey, Eric, why did uh, you have some incredible promoters? Which is one of the reasons I love discussing this time period of wrestling and a little bit before. I mean, some great promoters. The, the Fullers were, were great promoters in Knoxville and, and Florida. Dutch Mantel did a great job booking in, in different places. You talk about Luke Williams. You had great success in, in Dallas and San Antonio and Puerto Rico. Why did you guys stop say in the beginning of the nineties, why were you not go to WCW, WWE, Japan? Why, why all these incredible promoters that could promote anything that could basically be teaching a Harvard class in crowd psychology and how to do episodic, anything, television stories, anything. Why did all of a sudden you guys just kind of not go further? I'd say not further, but migrate to what the business became. Well, my my reasoning was I was too small. Uh, I didn't have uh, didn't have the body, and I knew that I wasn't going to get up and go to the gym every day and have that body. <laughs> and uh, I was just uh, uh, I was too small for Atlanta, too small for Carolinas, and uh, damn sure too far too small for Vince and Pat Patterson told me one time and said, I, uh, you know, as a booker, uh, come into the booking department up there. And, uh, Pat told me, he said, I'll see what I can do, but the old man still remembers you telling him no on USA network. <laughs> and, uh, you, you did that I, in, uh, in San Antonio, right? 
Yes, yes. And I told Pat, I said, Pat, I appreciate it, but don't waste your time. And uh, so, you know, that's, that's, that's my reasoning for not going to those places. <laughs> What because, was Blanchard's idea with USA Network? He was the first to get a national TV deal, if, if my understanding is right. Depending on how you characterize, the, say, the Dumont Network back in the day, but the first really to get the new cable television national deal. What was Blanchard's idea? Was he thinking about going national at that time? At that time, yes, yes. And I don't. I think they just never had, never accumulated the money to uh, – to front it once and uh, take it out to see what it would do. Uh, when I got there, uh, they were down to uh, two 30 second spots of mail order stuff to uh, keep the business going. And uh, I spent many a nights packing boxes in the office of a little wrestling baby picture, wrestling buddy, uh, a little towel with Southwest logo and, that was our hottest selling item. <clears throat> and then Sammy Cohen brought some jewelry over from South Africa. That we sold some rings for a while. So it, it was, uh, Joe was too nice to survive uh, as, as a full-fledged wrestling promoter. He was just too nice of a guy. But, too talent friendly is what I always understand. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. He believed in a talent more than he believed in the business. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He really did. He really did. You know, he wanted to make sure they could pay their electric bill, whether he could pay his or not. And John, John, I'm gonna kinda of, kinda of go in and answer answer Eric's question too. A lot a lot of a lot of the philosophy up north was we don't want to do things like they do down south. And why I never could understand that philosophy. Why? Because it, it was so successful down south, you know. But the, you know, the, everybody thinks they got their own method, and that, that we were too, too country and too hickeys to to work any place else besides the south, which is totally wrong, as we all know, as everything turned out. So that, that was kind of it. You're too too southern. Yeah, and you know it's it's funny that you mentioned that when I when I first came up, there were people in WWE that didn't like my southern accent, yeah. <laughs> you know. The, but then, but then you have then all of a sudden Stone Cold becomes the hottest guy in the history of the company, or one it of change a lot of attitude. <laughs> yeah, and Jim Ross becomes the commentator that led us through the entire Attitude Era. So that it, it changed quite a bit uh, thanks to uh, those two guys. Well, Derek, were you in San Antonio when uh, Steve Simpson came over, Sammy Cohn's son? Yes, yes. The, the 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 most diamonds I've ever seen in my whole life times a thousand. I remember when Sammy Cohen come in, set his briefcase down on Joe's desk and opened his briefcase. They had diamond mines in South Africa, and he brought all these diamonds over here to sell. And uh, me and Tully's girlfriend—I probably shouldn't have said that—but uh, anyway, we uh, went to a couple jewelry stores. Uh, selling this selling these diamonds and stuff for him and she was doing the talking and the selling and i was doing the making sure nobody stole the briefcase <laughs> but yeah so these there were these diamonds cleared through customs or just kind of happened to end up in the united states i wasn't on an airplane i don't know <laughs> if, I, if i was a betting man uh i mean i couldn't hold them in my hand like that I, all of them. I mean, just, oh, it's unreal. unreal. I always thought Steve was the guy that was going to end up, you know, big, big time. And apparently he had the opportunity. I talked to Steve recently at, at something, you know, and he had the opportunity, but chose to stay in Dallas because of Fritz. You know, Fritz, after the, you mentioned the Cotton Bowl, told him, says, you know, you're my guy. And then Steve said the next year, Fritz was sitting there talking to somebody else going, you know, you're my guy. And he's going, oh, man, he got me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But yeah, Steve yeah. had an opportunity to go to WWE, and at the time, you know, Dallas was so hot that he chose not to. And uh, you know, that's one of the reasons that he ended up finishing his career mainly, mainly in Dallas. But Steve had, oh man, you talk about a a great, great talent and a great look. I mean, that was something. You know, you just you draw up a picture of a wrestler; it looks like Steve Simpson. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, and a good guy, good guy, good guy. Great. I, I remember when I, I, John, you were there. I, I booked him over in J in Japan, 
And and a lot of those guys were saying, well, he's not tough enough to do this. You know, he's just too much of a pretty pretty boy and that kind of thing. But he went over there, boy, and he handled himself really well. Uh, he, he was really great in the ring. And he did really well. We were in Korea, and we were with, <laughs> with a bunch of shooters. I mean, we're not even sure if these guys are going to work. You know, we right. really weren't. And, uh, you know, I ended up with the boss, uh, Lee Wan Pyo, who was – pretty much a shooter but he he worked i knew i was i was probably in a working match but steve didn't know that i mean he had this young guy that was a big time shooter with the cauliflower ears and all jacked up and everything and steve said i got a plan to embarrass him if if this goes south and uh sure enough he got out there and it worked fine but steve had no problem getting out there i steve's a yeah. steve's a pretty salty guy yeah he, he did a great job over there i, I was he did I a was great really job proud. I mean, they loved yeah. him over there. Everywhere Steve yeah. went, he was successful. Yeah. As as popular as San Antonio was uh, during that run there, how long did – and because it wasn't really a long period of time that that territory prospered and, and lasted like that. How, how long, Eric, do you, do you recall that, that territory was really good and what happened? I, you know, I don't know how, how – I don't know when it first started, <clears throat> but uh, I was there – probably a couple years until I left and uh, uh, Fred Barron, Fred, Fred something bought yep. Joe out. Fred yep. Barron, he was yep. running, up, he was running opposition using Fritz's talent for a while. And uh, then Fred bought him out. And then when Fred had a territory to run, it didn't take long for it to close down. John, didn't you go down there for him a couple of times? Yeah, sure did. Yeah, sure did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I enjoyed it. Yeah I, yeah, I enjoyed it everywhere I worked in Texas. I got to work near, near all the territories. Even got to work in, in uh, Amarillo some. You know, I got a, I got the tag with Terry Funk. So, yeah, it was uh, – yeah, it was, it was an incredible time, especially for a kid who grew up watching this wrestling to then wrestle all the guys that you watched, you know, it wasn't like I, I grew up in California and came to Texas. You know, I grew up in Texas watching the Von Erics and the Funks and. Hey, J and John, John, I'll jump in here. Uh, where, where you were le living, your location, were you able to pick up each one of these territories wrestling or what, what you only got to Dallas or what, what did you get out there? We that? got, I was right at the line in Sweetwater, where we got the the Von Erichs, obviously, uh, Channel 11, KTVT, I believe it was, Saturday night show, I think 10 o'clock. And then we also got some of the Funks uh, out of Amarillo. But no, we didn't get any Blanchard. We didn't get any Guerrero out of El Paso. And we got no Houston. But we got we got a lot of the Funk stuff, and we got all the Von Erich stuff. Well, let's jump, let's jump down to Houston. Uh, James, did you and Eric both work for Paul down there or what? No, I, I don't. I don't ever recall working for Paul in Houston. Yeah, uh, just, uh, just I never worked for him, but I, I, I knew him. I knew that his was family. such a unique place, Incredible. you know, because Paul, Paul really didn't have a have a territory or or anything. That, that no. was, you know, I, 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 you know, he had an office, of course, but you know what? When in our terms of an office is a territory, and the guy right. running. He, he usually just uh, existed on bringing guys in from the outside. Yeah, he, he took that over from Morris Siegel. Yeah, Morris it, Siegel and, and it, Siegel's brother, right? Yeah, and, and, and that was actually the, the main booking office in Texas that had Dallas part of that and all that at one time. And that's where all the, the stuff with Ed Watt and, and Fritz got all into a mess, and, and it, Fritz ended up taking it all over. Now tell us a little bit about that story. That's a great story. Well, I don't know all the details to it. That that was long before my time, but uh, I do know that, that 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 you know Fritz had gotten involved with uh, Ed Watt in Dallas, and and uh, it became almost like a little war. You know, they they were they were really kind of going back and forth with each other, and and there was a while there when when Fritz and Ed got kicked out of the Sportorium. They had they had to run another another building there in the Dallas area, and that. Eventually, they just ended up uh, kind of over overpowering what Morris was doing and took it over. And I don't know if Paul had anything to do with that or not. But uh, but uh, you know that was that was a real interesting time back then. I wish I knew all the details. Yeah. Hey guys, before we uh, run out of time, uh, I'll do something kind of a little fun, right quick. Uh, Want to rank your top three Texas Cowboys? 
and just and so I'll go first to give you guys a little bit of time. Is that about. many? Yeah, there there are that many. So I'll go I'll go first to give you times a little bit of time to think about because all the great cowboys that were in Texas and all the different territories. So the top three uh, Texas wrestling cowboys. So I will start off number one in my book, the bad man from Borger, Texas, Stan the Lariat Hanson. Number two, I will go Terry Funk. Now, no offense to Dory Funk, but I tagged with his brother Terry, so I'm going to give Terry the nod on, on, on this one. Number three, I'll go the man that went to Soul Ross that I just found that out yesterday, Mr. Dusty Rhodes, the American Dream. And honorable mention, I'm going to throw in one of my first tag team partners, Black Bart, who from what I understand from Akbar was actually born on the Arkansas side of Texarkana. <laughs> And if Bart sees this, he's going to call me and, you know, you know Johnny, you're a long, tall drink of shit is what you will. What you <laughs> and he, be, he would be right. <laughs> yeah. And I'll give a double honorable mention to Wild Bill Irwin, who I love, but is, was not actually a Texan. Damn Minnesota go for there. Yeah, you yeah. gotta I go give, I give a you third gotta go out, You gotta go out of state to name three Texans. No, no, no. I just I love Bill Irwin. I love Bart. And I'll give an honorable, honorable mention to Scott Casey because of the UFO story that he saw in San Antonio. <laughs> the greatest story ever on stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. The greatest story ever, the UFO story. Yeah, I, I wouldn't argue with any of those, John. I, I think Stan, even, you know, Stan didn't really work in Texas that much. It, 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 he, you know, he, I've he talked to him. Out. He, was, he was a smart Texan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he really kind of he got out and did some other things. But, and of course, his big name was in Japan more, more than anything else. But, but uh, yeah, Stan would have to be up there on the top of the list. Uh, you know, one, one of my favorites was Cowboy Bob Ellis when I was a kid. You know, he was, uh, I remember when my. Ellis was, wasn't from Texas, though, was he? No, he yeah. was from Texas. Uh, he Back went to McMurray in Abilene, yep. uh, Texas. He was. Uh, yep. the, the rumor uh, that we talked about before was was not correct. He was from Texas. Yeah, absolutely born there. Yeah, he. he uh, I, I remember when I was I was younger. I don't remember what age I was. I got to go to the Northside Coliseum where they were filming for Dallas. You know, the, that was the big Saturday night ninety minute show that that came out. And uh, at the, in that time, you could you could go down to the ring, get autographs, you know, before the matches and even after the matches sometimes. And he was a main event with Fritz one night. And, of course, he stayed in the in the claw half the, half the match. And, and it bloody and it was flowing, you know, everywhere. everywhere. And I, I ran up to the – ran up to get his autograph after the match. Somehow he got over and, and went down there. And I, and I could see the blood coming out. And, and nobody could tell me it wasn't real after that. I mean, I was convinced. That was it. Yeah, but but yeah, he was kind of a hero when I was a kid. So I'd have to put him in in the in the mix up there somewhere. But but Terry Funk probably, you know, I'd, I'd have to agree with that. And Terry Terry may have been the most entertaining wrestler I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, you know, it, regardless of of the style or whatever, he he was probably the most entertaining guy I, I've ever seen in the ring. Uh, and. uh and I'd, I'd, and I'd have to, I'd have to stick my old buddy Dick Murdoch up there too. Oh yeah, oh you know what, Dick, Dick Murdoch. Oh, you can't go back now. You are. No, no, I got to go back. I got to go back. back no, no, I was thinking about there this last no, night. There ain't no oh. mulligans in this sport, John. No, no, no. I was going to take a mulligan. I was going to put Murdoch number three, and I was going to give Dusty honorable mention because he didn't wrestle in Texas. Well, that yesterday you right, mentioned right. Blackjack Mulligan in your top three. Yep. Mulligan and Bobby Duncan also. Yeah, I, I, I was gonna. I, I was good. Mind, Big Bill, damn Texas man, you guys are hard. I, I, Jerry, so, you give Jerry, us what, the top the Cowboys. Who hey, are your top me. three then, Jerry? What? <clears throat> who are your top three then? I'm Mr. gonna let Eric go. He's a guest, man. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Hey, I got. I go throw in something real quick. Um, uh, golly, what's the name you just said? Mulligan uh, or Duncan? Duncan. Duncan. That's another Luke Williams idea in San Antonio. The mummy. We wrapped it, made it wrapped him up like God did we draw mega bucks with Bobby Duncan as the mummy. <clears throat> anyway, I think he saw that in Memphis before and brought it down there, but that worked like a big dog. All right. So is this money drawing or just my favorites? Your favorite. Either one. Your favorite. Okay. Your favorite. Cowboy Tony, Tony Falk tops the list because he's one of my best friends uh, I ever had in the wrestling business. 
uh, Tom Pritchard. Uh, Tom and me were partners for two or three years, and uh, we had uh, Jacqueline, Miss Texas, Jackie Moore uh, as our ballet, and uh, we had some great times. Jackie goes on one of my top three almost. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, now then then we go. Uh I I'm gonna throw in Layfield. Uh because I'm putting him as third for the simple my my thinking is John works like we all used to work back in the day. He he uh there's nothing that looks fake or bullshittish about anything he does in the ring. He's probably taking everybody's heads off. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> ain't no problem about it, brother. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's the way we all used to work, you know. Exactly. And uh uh yeah, you gotta be up there high on that list for that Thank simple you. reason. And uh then I go with Stan Hansen and the Funks for the same thing. They're, they were just all so damn believable, and yep. they would hurt yourself before they uh, gave you a chance to think something wasn't real. <laughs> Eric, well, first of all, thank you, but I, I got a great, great Tom Pritchard story for you. So I rode with Tom. I love Tom. I love both yeah. Pritchard boys, Bruce and Tom. Tom I don't know Bruce, but Tom, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tom – uh, Tom is just the best, but he's the worst driver of an automobile in the history of the world. Oh, oh, yeah. in the world. Yeah. So we're yeah. at Nassau Coliseum and Tom is ahead of us. And I'm with Charles Wright, the Godfather and Ron Simmons. So I see, I see Tom driving and I thought, you know what? I'm going to hit, hit him from behind. And like we used to do in the rent a car, you know, I used to hit, <laughs> hit him from behind. So I hit him from behind and, and I hit him again. And I'm just, we're playing, you know, just having fun going down the road, hitting each other. And all of a sudden, Tom stops in the middle. Tom stops in the middle of the road, and he gets out and he wants to fight me. And I thought, <laughs> oh, "What are you mad?" And so I, I rolled down the window because I thought if I get out, he's going to punch me, and I don't want to fight Tom. I love Tom, and and so I rolled down the window. I said, "What are you mad at?" He goes, "It's my personal car, you idiot." <laughs> <laughs> and Charles Wright, the Godfather, goes. Why would anybody buy an, buy an Altima? Tom <laughs> goes, I like my Altima. And got back in the car and drove off. <laughs> hey, Jim. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're talking about Tom Pritchard. And I feel the same way. I love Tom. He's an incredible guy and great teacher this, nowadays. You know, he, he's a guy that, that – uh, in, is going to be inducted into the, the uh, Tragus Thez Hall of Fame with the, as a trainer. And should and, they do it? Something that something that Jerry and I uh, Jerry got me involved in in down there, and I'm very proud of that 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 uh, that organization, and, and really happy to see Tom being recognized this year at, at this July. And, and that's uh, awesome. I can't wait to yeah. go because I I think the world. Is, I love Tom. Oh, yeah. wonderful, guy. wonderful guy. So, Mr. Yeah. Briscoe, your last. Your top three or whatever, Texas Cowboys. Okay, my my, my number one, and I'm gonna kind of go tag teams here, and now I'm gonna I'm gonna just throw a, a couple of names out, you know. And, 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 and the, my my top Texas Cowboys got to be number one, the Texas Outlaws, Dusty Rhodes and Dickie Murdoch. I get two of those guys in the top with with one one statement there. So there were nobody better. And what what a what a unique tag team those two guys were i mean they were incredible and i told you they could kick ass they could wrestle they could talk they could make you cry they could make you laugh and they could they 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 just had fun working you know they had fun being in the ring and the two of them together they just had that magic chemistry that very few guys have when you team a couple of guys like that up and they were at that time they were two guys just starting in the business and they were both busting open with talent. Vern gave the Texas Outlaws a chance to grow and become what what individually what they became. But I think those two guys there were probably at the top of top of my list there. And, and then number hey, two, hey, wait, wait, Mr. Briscoe, you know, and I got I, I got to bring something up. The reason they came to Florida was because they rode an Appaloosa donkey into a bar, and <laughs> Vern had to get rid of them for a while because they were in too much hot water in in, in Minnesota. <laughs> And we were happy to have them down there. We'll find us the donkey. <laughs> they sold the donkey before they came down there. 
And number two, it had and a guy that that we mentioned that gets very little uh, pub and very little press for some reason was Bobby Duncan Sr. and San Hanson together as a tag team. Man, those those guys were brutal out there. They, as Eric said, they worked that old style where they, John Layfield picked up a lot of the both of those guys stuff because he was tag team with Bobby Jr. And Bobby Jr. of course picked it up from his old man. But the, those two together, they knock your damn head off, man. Those two guys, when you're in the ring, uh, you know, as a baby face, you want somebody, you want somebody on top of you all the time. You never had to guess where these guys were because they were always within arm's length of you. So as a baby face, you want somebody close. You want to fight. You want to, you know, if you got any this stuff inside of you, you want you want a contest. Bobby, Bobby Senior and 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 Stan would would, would were that they were they they'd come to play most of the time. They come to fight, you know, and uh, and they were they were just fantastic to work with, fantastic at as a heel team and if you were a baby face team, they were right there when you needed them. You didn't have to, to where the hell are they now? Are they out arguing with the crowd? They would argue with the crowd, but it was usually when they were in their own corner, the other guy was on top of it. And, and if tag team out there, if you want a lesson on how to be an aggressive tag team, watch, watch, watch knock them in the hands of man. They were, they were fantastic. Then I got to throw that. Hey, Jerry, before you go to the next, yeah. let me let me just cut you off. You know, San Martino famously always said, you know, uh, uh, Stan broke San Martino's neck, you know, but, but mistaken on, you know, said it was a lariat, but, you know, that's for storyline. Then Stan had the, the match of the year at Madison Square Garden. I think it was 1976 in the cage match with, with uh, Bruno. You can look it up on YouTube. It's just amazing. But when he called Bruno to, you know, apologize, you know, for the neck, he said, you Texas boys always hurt me. Duncan had broke his arm. <laughs> so the two Texas boys had, had put out the biggest draw in, in New York. So they knew the right guy to hurt. Yeah, what they, it? Well, they, were, they were smart Texans, which is which kind of strange to be a Texas and putting smart and Texas together. You know? <laughs> but yeah, those guys were, they, they were fun to work with. Too. Even though they were brutalized, you in that ring, man. And you'd come out of there, holy shit, but you'd come out smiling because you knew you did what your job was description was, was to do. That was the entertain out there. Then, like I said, my number three has got to be the Dory and Terry Funk, man. They personified cowboys. And speaking of cowboys, the old man's got to be right in there uh, uh, with those guys. And, you know, the, the things that came from that Amarillo territory, we didn't really get a chance to discuss Amarillo, but, you know, Hardcore wrestling really was developed in West Texas with Dory Funk Sr. I was reading an article today that I didn't know him. Him and uh, uh, Ted DiBiase's dad. What was what was his name? Uh, Mike. Mike DiBiase. They went a three-hour Texas death match. Three hours. That athletic commission had to come out and stop the match, and I think they continued it the next week until they finished. <laughs> But that that spawned, you know, the Texas bull rope matches. It it spawned so many other matches, you know, out of that uh, at Texas death match. And so, you know, the Funks Terry course is, is uh, you know, beyond beyond uh, comparison with anybody. But Dory Dory and uh, Dory gets overlooked a lot of time because of, of Terry's talent. But Dory Dory, I mean, if you wanted a scientific match, Dory could go out there for 60 minutes and entertain, have you standing that last five minutes, have you standing and and and, and, and booing the hell out of him and, and getting the job done and Terry the same way. Those two guys, along with, with the old man, uh, Dory Senior, I worked all three combinations with those guys. And, man, I had a ball each and every time I went in there. And they were all awesome. Man. And like you mentioned, John, Cowboy Scott at Casey. You know, one 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 of the greatest guys in the world. I traveled up and down the road with Eric. I think out in San Antonio, you had him a little bit out there. Yeah, yep. sure you, you run across him there a lot. And about good guy. You know, he, he what a great story guy he is. You know, then the UFO story is, is second to none on this podcast. There, it's our, our number one marker at all times. And there was a cowboy Frankie Lane that was kind of kind of gets lost in so old time cowboy Frankie Lane. Cowboy Frankie Lane was one of those guys. He wasn't a big, big, uh, obnoxious cowboy, but he was a cowboy from Texas. And, but he could go. He, he was one of those just solid, solid performers that 
that was there for you each and every night and a brilliant guy outside the business too. And he was one of my, one of my very first mentors in, in, uh, and when I broke in in Oklahoma. And then you got to go with those Kozak brothers, Jerry and Nick Kozak, man. John, I'm sure you saw a lot of them, and and and, uh, and James, I'm sure you did yep. too. Yeah, Nick and Jerry, they they were skilled guys. They were baby faces, heels. They could go either way if you wanted them to go. There were so many of them. I'm sure we're all leaving. All, all four of us are leaving a few guys out that deserve to be on us. But I think we hit the hit the main main stage with the Hansons and the, and the Duncans. And the Layfield and John 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 go has to go along with that thing because of his longevity with WWE and his and his drawing power that he had there and and his stiffness in the ring especially the stiffness in the ring and I never heard anybody complain about John being overly stiff and trying to hurt somebody you know except, except Ricky Morton maybe except, well yeah well Ricky uh, Ricky cry if I if I worked with him and I'm not a stiff <laughs> Ricky hasn't forgiven John for that first match yet, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I think we I think we hit a lot of those cowboys and I think we hit a lot of touch. We 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 <laughs> you know, let's briefly touch on San uh, on on uh, on El Paso just so we're 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 not we 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 covered the whole thing. There was another couple of minutes if we could. Uh, any of you guys know any much about San Antonio or am I the only one that worked in that area? Or not San Antonio, but uh, El Paso. I never worked there. It was all Gory Gore down you know. there. I mean, uh, what a family they were, and you got to include those guys and in great Texas workers too. I mean, uh, the, all of them, you know, from Mondo to Hector to Chavo. I was just with Chavo Jr. this past weekend, and we we were discussing a little bit. I told him what we were doing. He could, he said, "I can't wait to hear it." But uh, you know, his dad, uh, the Gory Grill, uh, he read up that El Paso area there, along with Juarez and. When you run those border towns, man, you can't you can't have the the pussyfooting type wrestling going on. You you got to have some some scuffling going on there. And and, and Dory Dory with his, his crew down there, he brought a lot of guys in from uh, from uh, Amarillo, of course, and a lot of guys in from uh, from Dallas and, and Houston. But they had a great territory there for years and years and years, and a great tradition there. So uh, the the whole state of Texas with all those territories. Man, you had all those different territories. They were different in philosophy sometimes, but they were all all united when it come to to draw money, and they had that magic ingredient on how to how to get people in the building. And and Eric, to give you a little uh, inclination, I don't know if you heard the story. I know James and uh, Mr. Briscoe have, and I've told it several times. Uh, Gory Guerrero. You know, I was going to wrestle Eddie Guerrero in the Staples Center coming up uh, for the first big uh, you know main event for the championship. And we weren't selling many tickets. And so Chavo, Eddie's brother, he came up with the idea. And I think it was very similar to an angle he did with Piper back in the Coliseum is what I think it was. It was a family angle. So we're going to, and Mother's Day weekend was coming up in El Paso. And we were, Eddie was going to honor his mother after we wrestled this match that night. I was going to come back out and jump Eddie. And the mother is going to fake a heart attack and be carried out of the arena to the hospital. Okay. So when they when I when they start the ceremony at the end of the night, the entire arena was chanting "Gory, Gory, Gory" for Gory Guerrero. I mean they, that guy was over like you would not believe. So when I came back out and jumped Eddie and the the, the mom Mrs. Guerrero worked the heart attack, that place went from chanting "Gory Guerrero" to you could hear a pin drop in that arena. It was the most eerie thing you've. I, it, to this day, I can still feel it. And I'm sitting there a, a arm link from Mrs. Guerrero because I put my hand on her shoulder like I was forcing her down. But what I did was she grabbed my hand where she could help herself down. She was 74 years old. She so, was working. She was working. She was working. She down to work. <laughs> oh, and I see her go down. I think she had a heart attack. I mean, I, I know she doesn't, but I'm thinking there's not a Guerrero that can't work. That place was so enamored by Eddie Guerrero and his father, Gory Guerrero, they had to have extra state police around the ring. They had to give me a police escort out of town. They got me out of, out of town, <laughs> completely out of town. The police stopped at the El Paso city limit and told me, said, listen, go to, go to Odessa and fly out. We think if you stay in El Paso, you could be killed. Literally. So I, I sit and drove all the way to 
Odessa, when that video aired, everything changed. We ended up setting an all-time attendance record at the Staples Center. And, and, you know, then Eddie, because of that, a month later, they put the title on me. But that was all because of Eddie and Gory Guerrero, the legacy of the Guerreros in El Paso, and Eddie's brother Chavo coming up with that. So when I say I, I owe everything to Eddie Guerrero and the Guerrero family, I owe everything. Because he gave me a storyline that not just was the best storyline that I was ever a part of, a storyline that took the title off of him and put it on me. And that's what uh, the Guerreros did for me. And it was all because of the popularity of Gory Guerrero in El Paso that that thing worked. I mean, it was just, it was, it was an amazing time. I'd love to have met, uh, you know, I met Miss Guerrero, obviously, <laughs> but uh, I'd love to have met Gory Guerrero because apparently he was a terrific human being. You met him, didn't you, Jerry? Oh yeah. I work for him now. It, it was wonderful, man. I, I I never saw him work anything like that because he'd done retired. He was just doing a promotional gig at the time, but his, his presence when he was near you, he was one of those guys, you know, you, we've all been around those guys. When, when a guy you had that, when they come up to you, man, you could just feel that, you can feel that, that whatever it is, that charisma or whatever it is they have, you can feel it, feel it with them. And Gory was one of those guys. You just knew he wasn't just an ordinary guy in the, in the back of the stage there. But, yeah. yeah, and apparently we were told by uh, Hector Guerrero that uh, the bro that his brother Mondo was named after a wrestling uh, newspaper headline because he had been in a, in a riot the night before and named Mondo after part of the riot uh, from <laughs> from the from the riot in the newspaper. Well, well, guys, guys, I, 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 if I can, if I can go back here, and I and it, it's our show, so I can go back. But I'm going to say, Cowboy Bill Watts. We're talking about cowboys. I mean, Watts. He's from Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Yeah, but he's still a cowboy, John. We got cowboys in Oklahoma. Better cowboys. A <laughs> yeah, lot, lot smarter. Sure. A lot smarter cowboys. <laughs> Hey, Murdoch used to always, James, you remember, any time Texas would play Oklahoma and Texas would, would win, he go, oh, man, we got to we got to call Watson Jr. He absolutely <laughs> just, he just wore them out. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, Nick, I, I, Nicky Murdoch I, paid me a bet one time on Texas, Oklahoma with Japanese yen. Although one <laughs> of yen coins, he carried them all the way back from Japan. Had to be a thousand or two thousand of those little you know that were one one yen which is what maybe a tenth of a cent there they had an old yeah. damn shoebox full of them briscoe i got your money come up with the damn shoebox pack full of one little cent yen uh that's <laughs> great yeah I, I i got i worked dick's last match in amarillo and, and you know what a character he was boy i love that guy well guys any final thoughts on Great, the great state of Texas. Yeah, Texas sucks. <laughs> Mr. Briscoe, that was horribly uncalled for. You'll probably judge our editor, so I'm sure that'll be gone. By the by the time by the time I edit that, Mr. Briscoe will say Texas is the greatest place ever. I love it. <laughs> well, guys, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on uh, Stories with uh, Briscoe and Bradshaw, the flamboyant one, Hall of Fame referee James Beard. Appreciate you guys. Enjoy. Hey, thanks. Thank you, John. I, I appreciate you guys thinking of me and uh, inviting me back on your show. And uh, the last time I was on your show, I got a ton of emails that I really appreciated getting. So I'm going to plug my email, and it's real simple, Eric Embry at letters B B T E L dot com. So any questions or anything, you know, I love hearing from uh old acquaintances and uh, making new ones. Appreciate you, guys. James, you got, you, got, you got anything you want to plug your website or anything? Well, I mean, I, I, the, the main thing is, you know, I'm working with this group in, in Texas called Texas Style Wrestling. We're, we're trying to kind of get back to that same old thing you talked about. And then and, uh, and, and you can find us online and streaming. And, of course, you know, the, the thing that I think you and I both are passionate about is that Tragus Fez uh, Hall of Fame and you know, that's become really something that I'm really proud of being a part of. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful organization. And you hit it up, and, and uh, uh, man, it's a bunch of good people, and I'm looking forward to this next one. That's our, our 25th anniversary. We've already yep. got, like, already uh, uh, 
uh, uh, committed to come. Arn Anderson, uh, Tony Schiavone, uh, uh, Al Getz as as a Belby Award, a great historian. Uh, that uh, if you ever seen any of his book, he, he you're a very unique way of writing. He charts the territory where he takes each individual talent and kind of charts them, kind of like the stock market, and gives a value to to them, the houses, the attendance that they drew, and all this stuff. Very, very good reading and then very, very unique style. So we got Al, we got a couple other big announcements coming up. They, you know, we're going to have a cast of thousands, as Hollywood says, this year over 25th anniversary. You know, and so anybody, anybody, we're pleased to have James Beard as one of our, our representatives, Troy Peterson, Chad Olson, Troy and Lovell out, out, out in uh, Colorado. These people do a fantastic non-paid job and john's been supporting us for for the last 10 years or so and john when john was there the night i got so much heat for selling kurt angle's uh plaque hall of fame plaque <laughs> i got and i gotta say so i never said it publicly on guess but uh, uh eric's on here now and i don't think i've ever worked with anybody smarter or more talented than eric embry i can tell you that well you learned it all from jack and i <laughs> hey, and it's and it's eric's birthday happy birthday eric yes Thank that's you. absolutely and tomorrow's my and my wife for uh leap year it's our 11th anniversary we'll do the math john <laughs> <laughs> she's a brave woman and she deserves a, a whole block in heaven yeah Thank you.